It's starting to feel like summer because the Kendall Yards Night Market is back. How people can enjoy the weekly event safely. Some of us got some showers today, but I'm tracking some more much needed rainfall that's on the way for tomorrow. I'm actually really nervous and scared. Um, we've had no rain and everything is so dry. And fire forecasters warning of another potentially bad wildfire season. So tonight we talked to people in Malden and Pine City about how they're preparing just eight months after the bad road fire decimated their communities. Good evening and thank you for joining us for Krem 2 News at 11. I'm Mark Hanrahan. Hello everyone, I'm Regina on. First up tonight, trouble at Palouse Falls. A Walla Walla man recovering tonight after rescuers say a football sized rock knocked him unconscious when he was hiking yesterday. And according to the Franklin County Sheriff's Office, a rock dislodged and hit him in the head. Weather conditions prevented Life Flight from getting a helicopter down to his location, so he was, quote, hoisted out by pure muscle by Columbia Basin Dive and Rescue and other responding agencies. And according to the Sheriff's Office, the man was then flown to a local area hospital for treatment and was conscious during his transport. The Sheriff's Office is reminding everyone tonight that Palouse Falls is a beautiful location, but the cliffs and river are are, quote, unforgiving to mistakes, missteps, and inattention. Idaho Governor Brad Little facing opposition from a fellow Republican in next year's primary, and the candidate happens to be Idaho's Lieutenant Governor. Janice McGeechan this afternoon announced that she is running. She says, well, she, she rather is from Idaho Falls, and she served in the Idaho House from 2002 to 2012 and is now in her first term as Lieutenant Governor. She has spoken out against Governor Little's coronavirus related restrictions, and she says she is running on a platform of individual rights, state sovereignty, and traditional conservative values. Meantime, the push for a new state called Greater Idaho is getting some support. Five Eastern Oregon counties have voted in support of considering becoming part of Idaho. Yeah, so Baker, Grant, Lake, Malheur, and Sherman counties joined Union and Jefferson counties to join the GEM state. And the chances of the counties actually joining Idaho are slim, though. Both Oregon and Idaho legislatures would have to approve, plus federal approval would be needed, and state constitutions would have to change something that hasn't happened in 150 years. Two Washington families suing a dairy company after their children were hospitalized with E. coli infections. They claim Pure Air, which produces PCC community market brand yogurt, should be responsible for their illnesses. The family says their children showed serious symptoms, with one girl spending time in the ICU. The State Department of Health says the recent E. coli outbreak is likely linked to the yogurt. Spokane County has received $50 million in funding from the American Rescue Plan. The county will get another $50 million within the next year, which must be allocated by December of 2024. The county says along with additional federal relief already received, they will work with the community to assess and identify areas that still need some relief. We'll call it another sign, things slowly getting back to normal. The Kendall Yards Night Market opened for the season earlier tonight, this time with fewer COVID restrictions than back in a year ago. As Krem 2's Morgan Trow explains, people and vendors were happy to see the open air farmers market return. The Kendall Yards Night Market is back, and one vendor says it's busier than ever. We, yeah, we actually sold out of all of our loaves of bread probably about maybe 15 minutes ago, but they're going to make more next week. The pandemic hit Arabesque Farms and Bakery hard. What just happened? I just sold my last loaf of bread and I ran out of uh, brown paper bags also, which is like never happened this fast ever at any market actually. Go ahead. Carrie John sold more than 70 loaves of bread in an hour and a half. Arabesque is one of the nearly 80 vendors and restaurants participating in the first night of the season. I think that's the fastest ever. It just, it kind of started early at 430. It was already crowded and it's just been consistent ever since. John says they suffered financially during the winter. The bakery typically relies on craft shows, but the pandemic canceled them. She says they held their breath when putting out their booth this year, nervous that people wouldn't show up. I know it's hard with the COVID and the times are hard and money's tight. One piece of focaccia with pesto. There are some additional COVID-19 protocols. This includes stalls spaced six feet away from each other, hand sanitation centers, and food sampling must take place at tables. John says the rules are totally fine. She is just happy to see the community come together to support local businesses. And we're going to be here every week and we're looking forward to see everyone back next week. Arabesque's entire menu sold out in about two hours. As they started to pack up and leave as closing time got closer, more people were still coming in to check out their stand.
So if you need to get your farmer's market fix, this event will be taking place every Wednesday from 5 to 8 in the evening, starting now to mid-September. Reporting in Kendall Yards, Morgan Trow, Prem 2 News. It was definitely a lot of fun out there, but it was a bit chilly, but we did need a little bit of that rain today, and it sounds like we could get some more tomorrow. Let's get straight to meteorologist Thomas Patrick in the Outdoor Weather Center. Thomas, doesn't look like it's raining yet tonight, but a bit cooler out there, right? Yeah, and actually between our 10 and 11 o'clock show, we did get a light shower, enough to wet the ground beneath my feet, and there's actually just one or two raindrops that are kind of spinning in between the studio lights and where I stand in the camera uh, where you are all watching me from uh, here at this hour, but it's not enough to get really anything wet at the moment. We are tracking a few light showers that have been consistent enough throughout the day, but scattered here or there. In fact, the airport has been hard pressed to get any rain whatsoever today. Meanwhile, other locations are probably like, oh, we got a decent downpour at least at some hour. And here we go, uh, especially between Spokane and Cord well, Spokane correlate a little bit to the south, just some scattering showers uh, across the region here, uh, even as of this hour, hoping they actually coalesce into a more widespread rain into the morning hours tomorrow. So this rainfall isn't done quite yet, which is very good news for us. Look for morning rainfall scaling back to some scattered showers during the afternoon hours. Temperature wise, it's just going to be another cool day. In fact, today we only ended up, I believe, at 54 for the high. I think that'll be pretty similar to what we have on tap for tomorrow. But more importantly, it's the rain and this computer model has the most widespread rain in its forecast output that I've seen in months for our region, hoping this pans out to be true. So it becomes not if, but how much rain we do have in the works and how that compares to how little that we've seen over the last three months combined. I'll show you that comparison coming up my forecast in a few moments. Quick question for you, uh, Thomas. We have any chance of making up that three inch deficit in rain? Whew, we're not going to do that in one day, Mark, but maybe we can put a dent in it. Okay. You know, it's interesting, though. A lot of people do enjoy the rain and do enjoy this cooler temperatures that we're yeah, having. Yeah, 100 percent. Right? And we certainly need it, right? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Thomas. Well, the city of Spokane wants to use school district land to build a new water tower on Spokane South Hill, and they pitched their proposals to the SPS's school board tonight. And the city is proposing to build a 100-foot water tower at one of three locations. Those locations are at 31st Napa, 37th Avenue, and by Hamblin Elementary. During the meeting, a city representative said that the Hamblin area is the most ideal place for it. That's because it's closest to their existing transmission main and located in the center of their pressure zone. Now both the city and board know that wherever they choose to build will most likely cause disturbance to residents nearby and they're keeping that in mind. It's not clear when or if SPS will move forward with this proposal. Well, power companies haven't been shutting power off since the pandemic, but that could soon change. After a moratorium on disconnections, the Washington Utilities and Transportation Commission adopted a resolution for those shutoffs to resume. So last week, the commission authorized utility disconnections for electricity and gas starting July 31st. Last October, the commission ordered investor owned electric and natural gas utilities in the state to continue a moratorium on disconnections. With the new resolution, first disconnection notices could be sent out as early as June. Well, fire forecasters warning of another devastating wildfire season here in Washington. How people in Malden and Pine City are preparing just eight months after the Bab Road fire decimated their communities. Plus, later served with a side of skills. How one local restaurant is helping to teach students valuable life skills. Coming up next.